wheat, growing wheat, milling wheat and being engaged in a community of grain lovers has uh, held my attention for a number of years and is still doing so um, and just new things to learn about this plant that's um, been so associated with humanity for 10,000 years. This is The Producers. I'm Danny Vallant. Jason Cotter grows heritage wheat and mills it into flour at Tuarong Farm on the Mornington Peninsula. The peninsula, an hour from Melbourne, is better known as a wine region, but Jason wanted to do something different. His interest in local grain economies and his fascination with the fundamental place of wheat in the human story has taken him down another path. I'm Jason Cotter. I'm from Turong Farm on the Mornington Peninsula. Uh, we grow wheat and we mill it on the farm and sell it to uh, bakers, chefs and home cooks uh, locally and um, into Melbourne. I grew up in Langwarren, about 20 minutes from here. Um, and in the early 90s, my family um, sold our um, food company, Cotter Food Services, and uh, we bought uh, this place and... Um, I'd lived here on and off, although um, I was the only one in my family who'd done so. And then about 10 years ago, um, I came back here and uh, we renovated the house and, um, yeah, started a family and um, got more and more involved in farming, which really began as a uh, a hobby and then has sort of taken over and so it takes all our time now. Here on at Turong, we we have beef cattle as well as uh, crops, and we also have uh, wine grapes. Um, I've never been that interested in the wine industry, and uh, I guess when I moved back here and started um, being involved in the farm again, I wanted to do something that was um, my own, and um, I just put a little bit of wheat in, actually to. Uh, um, you know, train my dog has just turned up uh, um, on quail, but um, at the same time, I read a, a book about um, uh, the future of food uh, that Dan Barber wrote, uh, the American chef, um, and it got me thinking about local grain economies and you know the possibility of uh, shorter supply chains of uh, key. Um, commodities like uh, wheat and to treat wheat as a ingredient uh, rather than something that's just traded and has no meaning as food. Um, so I guess one of the main things we do here is trying to uh, restore wheat as something that's considered uh, a valuable food stuff and not just a commodity. Few people think about the Mornington Peninsula as a wheat growing region these days but it actually has a history with grain growing. Much of Jason's project has been testing rare and heritage weeds in this particular environment to see how they fare. We're well outside the wheat belt here in Turong. Um, the conditions are a bit different than uh, where grain is grown mostly in Australia, though fairly similar to other parts of the world. Um, I guess growing wheat on the peninsula has a long history, although in the last... 50, 70 years or so, it's only small pockets for, um, usually for feed rather than uh, milling into flour for bread. Uh, however, when the governor in Sydney sent um, a few boats out to look for a second colony, which ended up being Hobart, they found sealers and uh, escaped convicts growing wheat on Phillip Island, which is just a stone throw from here, uh, quite successfully. And uh, what we do here is grow wheat that is adapted to our climate and um, we've grown a lot of specialist varieties uh, to find what best suits our land and season length and um, so we've, uh, over the last few years amassed quite a collection of um, rare wheats some old some new some really old and um, yeah just it's been great to have uh, build a, what I guess is a library of uh, the history of the world I, I guess uh, in many ways wheat is um uh, uh, at the heart of human culture, where um, since the advent of agriculture, uh, wheat has been there and has you know, been through the formations of city states, um, trade surpluses, uh, trade itself, formations of countries, wheat is at the heart of it. And I guess more recently, 
kicked off the Arab Spring uh, in Egypt and across North Africa, wheat um, and the dearth of uh, wheat had a lot to do with that. So it's still at the heart of things. Wheat is endlessly interesting, so much more than a commodity, intersecting with history, geography, science and aesthetics, as well as nutrition and food culture. Local grain economies not only connect consumers to their produce, but also allow farmers to stay connected to the food they nurture and grow. Look, I've always had, a, I guess, a deep interest in it. It's something that you know, gets under the fingernail, so to speak. Uh, but, yeah, the, the wheat aspect of it really drew me in. There's so much to wheat. There's, um, you know, there's the production and the food side of it, but then there's the, um, I guess, the aesthetics for wheat, the beauty of wheat. Um, the culture, the cultural connections, um, you know, it's really intrinsic to to who we are, grain growing. And um, so I got interested in that. And I guess once you start collecting a variety of wheats, uh, you're engaging intellectually on where things are from, why were they grown, how they were grown, who grew them, and, um, you know, deeper still on their flavours, nutritional values and just an amazing diversity in wheat. Uh, I mean, if you look at the human genome and how complex that is and how uh, it's not very often you run into your doppelganger, well, wheat's even more complex genetically um, than humanity. So there's a lot there, uh, and we're only really, I guess, exploiting a narrow band of wheat genetics. And if you look back through the history of wheat, um, there's so much there that we could draw on um, for resilience in our agriculture, but um, also um, things like f- flavour potential, greater nutritional value. Um, we can reintroduce a lot of those things that, um, in some ways, uh, we've lost, not um, or at least can improve upon. Wheat is a key uh, global commodity, although Australia. Uh, is a minnow in global grain trade. It's still an important part of our agriculture in Australia. Um, however, there's few farmers that know what their grain tastes like, um, and I've found that there's a lot of farmers that really want to know what their grain tastes like. And um, I guess that engagement as people's produce is food is uh, being. Um, is resurgent in many ways. Um, uh, yeah, what would you say? Um, yeah, I, yeah. If you look at the commodification of wheat, uh, Australia, even deep into the seventies, had a real huge diversity in genetics and origins in wheat um, that made for a resilient crop. Um, in many ways, although incursions of new rust varieties um, uh, put an end to that in some ways. Um, but so did the Green Revolution and um, I guess the advent of um, semi dwarf genetics that were high yielding that could handle high nitrogen inputs and required mechanisation and I guess a more systemic use of um, um, ag chemicals and. Um, I guess what we're trying to do is minimise. Oh, yeah. What we're trying to do is minimise um, inputs and returning to a farming system that uh, we feel is sustainable. Um, that um, and also is a, a nutritious and um, flavoursome product. Uh, there's, it's not like um, you sit down and have a meal and think to yourself, "Gee, that was sustainable." You think to yourself, geez, that tasted good. So if you can have things taste uh, good and be sustainable, then um, we're on to something. There are thousands of varieties of wheat in existence and Jason has grown more than 600 of them. Getting to know which ones work best at Turong, both in terms of growing well in the conditions and also for flavour and digestion. Yes, yeah, so in terms of the diversity of, of wheats we're growing, uh, there's a few. We've got hundreds basically, Danny. I've got, we've grown in the last five years 600 different types of wheat, so it's gotten a little out of hand. Um, however, within there, there's some just true gems. Um, most uh, wheat in Australia from the milling market is... Um, 
hard white wheat. Um, although in the rest of the world, most of the milling wheat in, say, in the northern hemisphere is hard red wheat. And uh, red wheat's actually uh, grows better in this area because of the season length and also its ability to handle more provocative conditions um, like rain late in the season and what have you. Um, but it also offers a different flavour profile. So we've grown red wheats from, you know, for the last um, 300 years and some of them like Rouge de Bordeaux, which is a, a French um, wheat that um, uh, has a gr- good season length for here. It's a softer wheat. Um, it is also... Uh, doesn't have sort of antagonist to your digestion, so it's uh, found it's easier to digest, and um, we're looking forward to introducing that to eaters very soon. Um, we've also got uh, one that I imported through quarantine um, from a Bread Lab in the US uh, called Skagit 1109. It's a population of um, hard red wheats that uh, have significant diversity within infield um, and they adapt to the, the conditions in which they grow so it's you know interesting thing agronomically but also it's I think it's the only wheat that's been uh, bred uh, as a wholemeal flour and uh, with flavor at the core of decision making so it's another one we're looking forward to introducing soon um, the other, a few other cereals that we're interested in from a flavour point of view is um, we've got some long season uh, heritage rye, a, a German one, and some um, Swedish and Danish rye that uh, have high uh, ferulic acid content and a few other desirable things uh, for the distilling market. So um, you know, it's early days for that, but um, I suspect there's a market there for um, flavour driven grain in that vein as well. A few years ago, Jason and his wife Emma travelled around the world collecting wheat to try at home. But the process of getting wheat safely into Australia is complex and time consuming. Turning a teaspoon of seeds into a commercial crop takes years on top of that. Uh, So in 2018, uh, Emma and I went on a a collecting trip overseas uh, through North America and later in Europe um, and collected lots of different varieties of wheat. to bring them into Australia isn't that straightforward because of um, uh, biosecurity and you know the wheat industry being very important to Australia. Um, people are very concerned about bringing in problems, not not um, benefits. So uh, the process is you have a, a permit to import triticum species. Um, they're sent. Your samples are sent by courier to nursery stock at Mascot in Sydney. Um, where a, a cursory check is undertaken, then they get sent to a glass house at, up at Tamworth, um, that uh, a facility run by New South Wales DPI. They get grown out there for a season, and then you get uh, like probably like eight seeds in a pot. They'll grow out, and then you get whatever seed comes from the next generation once they've checked it. Um, so you start with a very small amount of seed. And you plant perhaps, you know, you might be 100 seeds, there might be 5 grams or 10 grams or, you know, if you're lucky, 50 grams worth of seed. You put that in a 6 metre plot and then you start the process of selection and bulking up. So, you know, you see what it grew like that first year and if it's worth pursuing, if you think it is, then you grow it again and then again and again. So it takes years and years to get a quantity together that you can even test without going backwards with your seed. Then you test it um, and um, bulk it up, uh, this what you've selected, and um, hopefully it's something people like. Some wheats beguile because they grow really well. Others suck Jason in because they're beautiful. And some of the most unlikely candidates end up surprising and thriving once they settle in. There's a few seeds that I fall in love with because I've researched them. You know, I look at their genetics and what their potential performance is and their suitability and you know their potential application. I think, oh, this is going to be great. And then you grow them, and they just don't go that well here. Uh, so, but because you're in love with them, like from an intellectual level, you grow them again and again. So I've actually got a few out there that I should have discarded. 
ages ago. But there's a few that I persisted with that just didn't like the first few seasons I grew them, or at least they needed to settle in and to self-select uh, genetically to suit here. And so I've got a few this year that are just cranking that the first few years I grew them weren't great. So, um, you know, in those first few years, you're actually selecting uh, the decent examples of those lines. So um, there's a few uh, North African um, durums that I've got. And I mean, the Italians claim to have the best um, pasture durums, but I guess because of the um, trade across the Mediterranean over millennia, a lot of the germs are actually North African rather than Sicilian or Calabrian. Um, and I've got a few that are, are just, they're just going so well this year. And they're really beautiful too. Like a couple of them, there's one called Medea um, that has a, it's almost like a lavender head. It looks like, you know, a row of lavender rather than wheat. Um, another one, Balayuni, which has amazing stay green deep into the season, in even in wet conditions. It's, yeah. The, the whole sort of thing's, Endeavour has been great just to engage with people across um, food and agriculture. So, you know, from wheat breeders through to restaurants, um, some of the restaurants in Melbourne, when they hear what they're doing and, you know, the specifics of what we're doing, they get quite excited about, you know, individual varieties, not not just that you, you're growing and milling and not, uh, you know, 70 kilometres from the city. They get excited about you know, what the actual plant is and where it's from and, you know, the full uh, narrative behind that grain. And I guess um, it's a good sell for them on their menus. When you research, farm, harvest, mill, pack, sell and deliver your own product, there's always something to do. So is there a typical day on Turong Farm? D- at different times of the year, there's different activities dominate on the farm uh, in the background there's always milling milling and milling uh, and sometimes I, I like to get a lot of milling done just so I can get something else done um, so I spend long hours in the mill um, with headphones on uh, we're just upgrading it now so it's got a nicer workplace so I'm actually putting a bit of lead light in the uh, the mill so there's a, a bit more than hard light up there um, yeah I it's, uh, I guess in autumn, it's all about getting seed in the ground. So you're waiting for a break in the rain, hoping that it's not going to be too much rain, um, preparing a seed bed and then sowing the seed and then waiting for it to come up. Hopefully it merges well and start to get springs away before the, the weeds uh, get moving too. Um, that's a very busy time of year, Um and this year we're, you know, we've sown wheat across several farms on the peninsula uh, and further afield. So, yeah, it's a bit of rushing around. But when the wheat does start coming up well and then you start seeing the differences in varieties or your main milling wheat performing really well, it's very satisfying. Um, actually, this year uh, on the plot cedar, I buried a, one of my favoured purple wheats far too deep uh, for it to emerge and nothing else emerged everything else was emerged except for this wheat and um and i thought oh, what's going on here so i went down and i was like scrabbling uh along the row in my hands and knees until i found the sort of little white coleopters way down deep though and so i was wondering oh you know should, should i just hand hoe this whole 200 meter plot to to um uh, get some seed away and I did for a little bit and I thought you know what I'll just let it run it'll self-select for long coleoptal so and which is actually favorable and it survived like wheat's a resilient um, plant and the will to live is strong so I've selected for a really long coleoptal by accident um, and it's actually lo- looking like a really great crop uh, and other times of the year um, the busiest times, I guess, a, a harvest. Um, it's always a bit daunting because our harvest window is, is months long. It's not just a week where we harvest everything or what have you. Because we've got so many different varieties, they've all got to come off at different times and it's a race against birds or weather or waiting till moisture uh, content drops low enough. And um, so that's very busy. Um, and this year we'll be here um, up the road, 
um, at a few other farms and then up at Rather Glen and across at uh, Karama in um, the Western District where we're increasing the seed of um, fourth and fifth year uh, wheats that we started with from, you know, five grams of seed and now I've got hectares of it. So I'm, it's a pretty exciting uh, harvest coming up this year. Wheat is so often sold as a commodity or basic foodstuff that it's not so common to think of it as having distinctive flavours. But those who go deep into wheat notice that it does vary a lot according to variety and terroir. So in terms of flavour of individual grains, yeah, I, I find even if you just chew on the grain and you can tell what it might end up be, whether it's worth pursuing. Uh, so there's kind of a sweetness to it or it lacks uh guess a, a bit of finish or all the things that you look for in flavour in you know wine or you know when people speak of terroir or the complexity of flavour you can really home in on that in something like wheat and you know for sure it's, it's subtler and for sure people uh, have better um, noses or responses to aromatics or, or taste. Um, like I know uh, Betsy Evans and Oak at Swan Bakery in Gippsland, um, she's got a really good um, uh, tongue for it, and so does um, uh, Mike Russell at Baker Blue and some of his staff. Yeah, they're um, yeah. I've taken grain in to them before and say, "Do you want this one or this one?" Even before it's milled, and they they have something to say about the taste of it. Um, Michael James, the uh, baker and um, author. Uh, gives very detailed notes on flavour. So, you know, I, I definitely have um, an idea of what I like, but then to get, um, I guess, experts, um, their feedback as well is um, fantastic. Weed is uh, is beautiful, really. Yeah, there's, um, there's few plants as, as beautiful as wheat um, en masse or even individually. Um, and for me... Uh, the greatest part of that beauty is the diversity in wheat. Um, if it doesn't matter what sort of day you had, if you go down into um, the trial plots where, where there's you know 200 different types of wheat growing, it's yeah it's quite calming to be amongst um, you know such beautiful plants. Um, there's ones that have got long horns that are hairy or chunky or uh, black or golden or red. Um, there's ones that are sort of have a lax vibe, others that are quite upright. Um, there's, um, yeah, f- ones that are strappy in their growth, others that have got fine straw. Um, and yeah, it's there is definitely um, something that has captured uh, my um, sense of beauty for sure that um, makes it all the more engaging to be growing wheat. There's growing wheat, there's harvesting it, but it's milling that turns wheat into flour. How does Jason tackle this crucial part of the process? We operate uh, a couple of stone mills and a roller mill. Um, I guess at our end of the market, milling is about retaining a fair amount of bran and germ in the flour so that you retain the nutrition and flavour and the individual identity of whatever you're milling. So rather than reduce things down to the endosperm or the white um, part in the middle of the seed where you end up with a white flower, you end up with a, a creamy flower or even you know, a quite chunky flower that um, with its flavour and its nutritional value is um, as important as its performance as flour. So in doing that, you actually retain the full nutritional package in the grain. So you don't have to add like folic acid or nice and and things like that um like um is done with regular uh white flour out of an industrial milling process um the stone mills we have is different to most stone mills that operate they're extremely slow and the rocks are, are i guess heavier and bigger and um we also have a sieve integrated into um the mill so that I return any bran that doesn't come through the initial cut into the mill until I achieve uh, a desirable extraction level, so usually above 85% extraction. 
Um, and uh, we also have – so it ends up being a fine flour, but it's actually high extraction rather than what you might think of as, a, I guess, a, a chunky wholemeal flour. Um, we do 100% um, wholemeal flours too, particularly our French red flours, our triticale um, and spelt and rye. And um, uh, because that's what uh, people desire. Um, but as a, I guess a general baking flour, if we aim for an 85% extracted flour, it's something that's high performance if we've hit the, our um, protein marks. Um, so decent quality protein, which comes from both um, uh, the grain you choose to grow, but also um, the nutrition in the soil that helps it achieve its potential. Connecting people to flour and the wheat it's milled from is a great pleasure and motivator for Jason. In the future, he plans to have a zero miles on-site bakery that completes the supply chain one loaf at a time. Yeah, we love uh, having visitors uh, to Turong Farm. Um, I think people generally are detached from uh, what happens prior to the bakery. So whether they're bakers that come or home cooks, uh, they don't realise what goes into producing flour in the mill or let alone in the paddock. Um, So to actually show them wheat, what it looks like, where it starts from, um, it's important to us as farmers, but I can see that, you know, it's one of the ways that people can engage with the natural world now through their food and to actually uh, be able to show you that whole process, um, yeah, from the the field to um, the mill and then into the baker in the future is going to be amazing for our business but also to I guess tell the story of wheat to people and um, I guess the plan is to have a destination uh, bakery that's um, uh, part of the local food movement um, and an extension of uh, I guess the small grains scene and um, to have visitors that um, can see the wheat, see it being milled, buy the bread. We also set, intend to set up a display space that's um, uh, I guess tells it the story of agriculture and um, displays the botanical diversity of wheat itself um, and I guess present a bit of our wheat library for the people to enjoy um, and um, I don't know I'd also like to include some sort of ag art thing as well because I think um, there's a lot um, culturally and artistically in, in agriculture that um, uh, people would enjoy as well if it was a destination bakery and I imagine in the future we'll be building an on-farm bakery we're just lining up our ducks uh, there at the moment um, yeah it's for me a farm our size we have to value out as much as we can so you know turning the grain into flour selling it um, as a premium product milled in a particular way but then uh, going further and turning that into bread um, will help us have a, a viable business long in the future um, in that sort of, I guess, value chain from um, paddock to plate, so to speak. Uh, it's the greatest value benefit is at, at the end and the greatest risk is at the start. So the farmer takes all the risk Um and unless they're growing on a large scale, uh, if they're not adding value along the way and having a share of um, the value, um, it's, it, yeah, it's a difficult business. Jason Cotter finds the intellectual and practical on-farm aspects of his grain business endlessly engaging. But there's something incredibly special about delivering his product to Melbourne bakeries, not least because of the bubka and buns that might make it home in the van. I love uh, going on a delivery run. In fact, I really don't like sending bags of flour off in um, with a courier. I like to load it up the night before and when I get in the car um, early in the morning and the whole thing's loaded with flour and you know, a trailer of flour, it just smells like fresh and alive in the car because I've just milled it in the last day or so. And I drive in, I see our customers um, have a bit of a chit-chat, go into their bakeries, um, help them with a few things and just get sent home with just heaps of bread and treats. So I stuff myself silly on the way home with 
you know, chocolate babka or f- fugas or, or what have you. It's really enjoyable part of the whole thing. And, you know, the, the kids in them are often say, oh, can you bring back some cardamom buns or something like that? And I might get, you know, five or six of them, but they won't all make it home, that's for sure. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's wonderful. Um, I love what I do because it's, um, it's really engaged me like physically, intellectually for a number of years and my interest hasn't waned and I'm someone who uh, gets very deep into um, whatever I'm into at, a ta- at, at the time and, you know, it might be six or 12 months down the line, I'll find something else I get deeply engaged with and move on. But wheat, growing wheat, milling wheat and being engaged in a community of grain lovers has uh, held my attention for a number of years and is still doing so um and there's just you know there's forever new facets to explore um with grain and new seasons to respond to you know in the paddock um new things to learn in the mill and just new things to learn about this plant that's um been so associated with humanity for ten thousand years wheat is an integral part of the human story complex responsive engaging and satisfying. For Jason Cotter, farming wheat at Turong Farm is a way of reclaiming aspects of the food system that have been lost and forging a more hopeful, connected and delicious future. This is The Producers, a Deep in the Weeds production. I'm Danny Vallant. Stay tuned as we talk to some of Australia's best farmers, makers and growers. Follow us on Instagram at Producers Podcast or contact us via deepintheweeds.com.au.